Prestige Ameritech continued saying that the U.S. mask supply was headed for failure. We just didn't know when. Until 2004, 90% of all surgical masks worn, and I'm, I'm including surgical respirators, were domestically made. That year, or about around that year, all of the major domestic mask sellers switched from selling domestically made masks to selling imported masks. Prestige Ameritech, who was founded in 2005, recognized this as a security issue in 2006. We thought that once America's hospitals learned that their mask supplies were subject to diversion by foreign governments during pandemics, they would switch back to US-made masks. We were wrong. She asked if we could ramp up production, and I said yes. We built more machines, bought an abandoned Kimberly Clark mask factory, tripled and tripled our workforce. America's hospitals needed us and we rose to the occasion. We told them about the high cost of ramping up and they, and they said they would stay with us. Unfortunately, most returned to buying cheaper foreign made masks when they became available. The company survived by laying off the 150 people who helped save the US mask supply by taking pay cuts and by taking on more investors. The H1N1 pandemic, this is 2009, 2010, wasn't severe enough to cause the foreign health officials to cut off mask shipments to America. So our predictions didn't come true yet. In a weakened state, but undaunted, Prestige Ameritech continued saying that the US mask supply was headed for failure. We just didn't know when. In 2004, to give my security story more issue, I formed the Secure Mask Supply Association. You can find it at securemasksupply.org. Paraphrasing Ben Franklin, I told three competing domestic mask makers that if we didn't hang together, we would hang separately. As China was poised to put all of us out of business and put the country at even greater risk. Crosstex, Gerson, and Medicom, all with domestic mask-making factories, agreed and joined the SMSA. Unfortunately, the Secure Mask Supply Association's warnings were also unheeded. During my quest to secure the U.S. mask supply, I had the privilege of working with three BARDA directors, Dr. Robin Robinson, Dr. Richard Hatchett, and Dr. Rick Bright. They were helpful and they encouraged me to continue warning people about the mask supply. I'll say a little bit more about that. After years of doing this, I quit many times. And uh, the only reason I kept doing it is because of the directors of BARDA. They would encourage me and ask me not to, not to quit. They said that they would express their concerns about the mask supply to anyone that I could get to call them, anyone except reporters. They weren't allowed to talk to reporters, which was very frustrating to me. They also weren't allowed to endorse the Secure Mask Supply Association. Dr. Robinson was going to do so until HHS attorneys told him that it could cost him his job. He called me personally on vacation to tell me that. I can confirm that the emails in Dr. Bright's complaint are mine. They are merely the latest of 13 years of emails I sent to Barna in an effort to get HHS to understand that the U.S. mask supply was destined for failure. Robinson, Hatchett, and Bright all wanted to remedy the problem. In my opinion, they didn't have enough authority. Their hearts were in the right places. America, told, America was told after 9-11 that governmental silos had been torn down so that different federal agencies could work together for national securities. But I didn't see any of that. The DOD, the VA, the CDC, and HHS could have worked together to secure America's mask supply. I had suggested this to BARDA and to the CDC uh, on several occasions. I will be happy to answer any questions that you have about Prestige Ameritech, the US mask supply, 
for my interactions with BARDA, the CDC, or Rick Bright. And again, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you.